Ladies and gentlemen, my good evening, sir. Hi. I'm nervous. You know me, I get nervous. Yeah, you're right, I'm not nervous. Yo, I'm with my people! Yes! Yes! And before we get started, you know what we need to do here? Hold on, hold on. Da -da 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 -da. You stay. Here, we're gonna do this. Everybody kind of like, make some noise here. Let's make some noise, there we go. Oh. Oh. That was the best ole, I think, this side of the Mississippi, all of 2023. You should be proud of yourselves. Woo! First of all, thank you so much for being here. This means the world to me to see your faces in real life. I know that I interact with a lot of you on YouTube through comments or questions or emails. Some of you are my patrons. Thank you so much for supporting me. But to be able to see your faces in real life and hug you and shake your hand, it just, it really means the world to me. Because when I started this little old YouTube channel, about seven years ago now, I had no idea what it would turn into. I just wanted to make videos about adventures in the hopes of inspiring you to get off your couches and to get out there. And for many years, not many people watched my videos, just my mom and my brother and a few others. And they're back there, hi mom and brother Ethan. Yeah. But over time, you started watching them a little bit more and you started telling your friends about my videos and now I have kind of a big channel. I mean, it's not huge, but it's like way bigger than I ever thought it would be, which is incredible. And it's all because of you. So thank you for watching my videos every Sunday morning at 8 a.m., right? <laughs> This event is a little bit different than the other ones we've done. It's just been me talking, which gets super boring, right? You're supposed to say no, no way, right? I wanted to invite some of my special, amazing friends to talk with you today because there are a lot of people doing good things in the world, good things in the bike world, bicycle advocacy, and I really wanted you to hear their stories. And that's who you're going to hear from first tonight, and at the end, then I'll get on and, and talk with you a little bit. But it's my absolute honor to have five wonderful people here. You can see them behind. We've got Maddie Johnson, Brooke Gowdy, Dan Hurd, Dana Durschweiler, and Jeffrey Mazell. Let's make some noise for them. <laughs> and a lot of them, or some of them, are not used to speaking in front of crowds. It's hard. It can be scary, you know? And so I want you to be as loving and as enthusiastic and supportive as you are for me, for all of them. Can you, can you do that for me? Thank you. Okay. I want them to feel the love from Team Doozer, and I know you can do it. So first up tonight, I would love to introduce you to a new friend of mine. I met him a couple years ago at Ragbri. His name is Dan. And at Ragbri, Dan is a phenomenon. Everybody knows Dan because he's always surfing on his bicycle. Dan has a heart of gold. He's one of those people who is out here to make the world a better place. And Dan has been through the ringer so many times and he's risen from the ashes. And his story tonight is really gonna inspire you. And he's inspired me as a friend. So Danny, I, and this is another funny thing, his name's not really Danny. I, have, I keep calling him Danny. And in my videos last year, I kept calling him Danny because I really thought his name was Danny. So at Rag Ride this year, everybody kept saying, hey, Danny, Danny, Danny. But his name's not Danny, it's Dan. So sorry about that. That's all right. You're now known as Danny on my channel. Danny, give me a hug. Yeah, brother. Oh. <laughs> One pedal at a time. Here you go, man. Have fun. Thank you. Hey, guys. Well, first I want to th say thank you to Doozer and the Priority team. This is my first speech since March of 2020, three days before the pandemic started. Uh, my last speech was to the military members in San Antonio uh, for suicide awareness, which is what I do. Uh, I rode the lower 48 states 
did 22,000 miles over three years, seven months, and six days for suicide prevention. Uh, it started out for myself when I started cycling. I started in July of 2017. I rode motorcycles before that. I stopped riding bicycles at 14 years old when I started riding dirt bikes. And I thought cycling was for kids or people that couldn't afford cars or anything like that. So uh, I had a friend, his name was Sean, he is Sean. He, uh, he tried to get me on a bicycle for four or five years. I laughed at him every time. It became a running joke. I'd tell him I'd meet him there on my motorcycle and I'd see him on my way back home, still pedaling to where we were supposed to meet up. And uh, it just, to me, didn't look like fun. But fast forward a little bit, I was uh, just getting out of the hospital for my third suicide attempt. I was planning my fourth already. Uh, I told everybody I was doing fine just so that people would leave me alone. And this friend, instead of asking me to go for a bike ride, finally came up to me and said, hey man, we're going for a bike ride after work. I didn't have a bike. I didn't have cycling clothes. I wore jean shorts. How many people wore jean shorts their first time riding bikes? Yes. Right? I wore those for about two months. <laughs> uh, and I rode a bike that was way too small for me. Uh, my buddy's like 5'6", five, 5'7", five, and I rode that bike after I did my tour of the country. I don't know how I rode that thing. But anyways, uh, what it was was I rode with him. He kept getting me on a bike. I stopped thinking about suicide in the moments. It was the third or fourth bike ride we went on. Uh, we went for, was, it wasn't supposed to be a long weekend, but it ended up turning to 166 miles over the course of the weekend. And I did 80 miles the first night. I was falling asleep while I was riding. They kept telling me, a couple more miles, a couple more miles. <laughs> <laughs> I fell asleep on the side of the road at one point. But anyway, so they, uh, on the way back, two of our friends decided they weren't going to ride back with us. I was, my friend, that, my friend Sean was like, I'm, every, every pedal out is a pedal back. I told you guys that. And I was in the military. I can't leave somebody behind. I was on his bike as well. So I was like, hey, man, I'm going to ride back with you but you gotta give me time. And uh, honestly, he was really supportive, even though I didn't realize it at the time, but I was complaining. Man, we've done all these miles already. We got 40 something miles left. He got tired of hearing that. We all would at some point. He turned around, he, we're from Massachusetts, so I'm gonna be censored. He was very nice. <laughs> but he, uh, uh, so he, he actually got up and he, he turned around and he goes, listen, man, it's one pedal at a time. It's left, right, left, right. Shut up and keep pedaling. <laughs> and I got so offended. I started doing military cadence in my head. I'm going to show this guy. And uh, we got back. We got back. We got done the ride. And I got so excited. I was 250 plus pounds at the time. <laughs> So the fact that I just rode 166 miles over the course of the weekend on my third or fourth ride was pretty impressive. It's, if I was in shape, uh, I was not in shape. So uh, that was kind of the starting point for my change and me getting into cycling. It was about a month later, he was, same friend was talking about, man, when I was your age, I wanted a bicycle across the country. And uh, that was July the end of July of 2017, March of 2018, I left and bicycled the lower 48 states. What inspired that was to visit the people I served in the military with. So for me, 35 states is where the people I served lived, lived. And to get to those states, I had to do 43 of them. So what's the extra five at that point, right? <laughs> and uh, my goal originally was to do 25,000 miles. This is comforts of the earth because I wanted to train myself to potentially go around the world at some point, which is still a goal. Um, but I started that journey for myself. I, was, I didn't realize it until I left that I was really depressed, really. Um, I was definitely suicidal until probably in November of 2017. And cycling changed that for me. I started getting healthy. By the time I left on my bicycle journey, I was 190 pounds. Uh, I, at some point, built a camper because of the pandemic that I towed behind me, which weighed 350 plus pounds. And with me on, it was over 500. Um, I got rear-ended by a car at over 65, almost 70 miles an hour. The only reason I'm alive is that camper. So yeah, uh, cycling is, as much as it almost killed me, it has saved my life. It has given me purpose. Uh, the little corner of the sign that you can see up here says, make a stranger smile. Um, that is my purpose in life. 
is to make people smile. I do that by doing tricks. I do that by just having conversations, making funny jokes and stupid stuff like that. But I made it so that my purpose in life is simple. And I think a lot of us struggle with keeping our purpose in life simple. So if you ever start struggling with what your purpose in life is, get on a bike, go have a therapy session. And remember, it's just to make people smile. That's all I got for you guys. And he has a new YouTube channel. Ride He's going to start creating uh, YouTube videos, so go check him out. Ride with Dan USA. Our speaker number two is Brooke Rowdy Gowdy. Come on down. I saw Brooke speak at an event in Boulder a few years ago and I was immediately inspired by what she does. She was a high school track star in Alabama, winning the state title and the one in the 200 meters. So I'm a runner, I love runners, it's so impressive. She rode the Great Divide mountain bike trail. She's all about mountain biking and getting women out on bikes, specifically people of color. Representation matters, right? And what else? You're just, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. Oh, I was gonna say something else. Oh, this is really important. All of you Coloradans might have heard about the Colorado Safety Stop. Have you heard about this? Yeah. That's where you can like treat a stop sign as a yield sign and a red light as a stop sign. And so you can kind of ride your bike through if you're at a stop sign and there's no cars, which makes sense, right? And it's a safety thing. The law um, started in I uh, Idaho. It was called the Idaho, Idaho Stop. And finally, Colorado adopted this last summer and Brooke played a huge role in that, advocating for House Bill what? Oh, I don't know. One, two, three, nine, four, six, whatever it was. <laughs> but you can thank Brooke Rowdy Gowdy for the Colorado Safety Stop. <laughs> All right, here we go. Thank you. Hello, how are you? Oh my gosh, it's so exciting to see such a large crowd here. Um, my name is Brooke Rowdy Gowdy. Um, I run an organization called Rowdy Gowdy, um, and that is where the rowdy comes from. We get a little bit rowdy. Um, I also am a co-leader of another organization called Black Girls Do Bike, um, and there is a Denver chapter, and it's exciting to see people here from that chapter. <laughs> I was not expecting that. Um, I'm gonna tell a story by going through some pictures really quick. Um, that's me being on a bike, being badass. Um, <laughs> um, so I had a friend who is the other co-leader of Black Girls Do Bike who um, rode her bike uh, across the country um, from east to west. Um, what is that called? What is that route called? The Trans Am, right. So she rode the Trans Am. It is the first bike packing trip she's ever done. Um, and I was having a glass of wine with her and her husband, and someone brought up the Great Divide mountain biking route, and they said, oh my gosh, Brooke, you should do that. Like, I ridden my bike from one end of the country to the other, and you should ride your bike from north to south. And I was like, there ain't no way. <laughs> there is no way. I've never bikepacked in my entire life. I don't think that is for me. Um, and they convinced me. Uh, they also brought in another great um, bike packer to help convince me, Lael Wilcox, um, who actually came out and gave me a pep talk and helped support me to go out and do this thing. And I was signed on. I was like, okay, I will do it. So the very first bike packing trip I've ever done was riding my bike from Canada to Mexico on the Great Divide mountain biking route. <laughs> it, it was an absolutely amazing adventure. Um, I learned a lot. I spent a lot of time learning how to read a map, learning how to understand fire danger. So this is my first time bikepacking, so I'm learning all of this on the trail. Um, I am learning a lot, reading my maps, um, traversing across uh, the United States. Um, also, 
checking out the most incredible views because I'm crisscrossing over the continental divide back and forth, uh, which is with the views comes a lot of climbing. <laughs> I was climbing like no other. Thank goodness I'm from Colorado and um, going for a 20 mile bike ride means that I'm climbing a lot of vertical feet um, on the Great Divide mountain biking route. Um, going for a 30 mile ride means you're probably gaining about 6,000 vertical feet on that day. <laughs> so it was difficult, but it, was beautiful and people were so excited to see me out there um, there are lots of friends who came out to ride with me a great photographer evan greens found me because i was carrying a tracker so everybody was tracking me i'm also a, a school nurse and so all the kids at school and their families were tracking me as i was going across the united states um, and it was so exciting to have surprise visitors they would track me and find me and then just come out and ride with me um, obviously because i was like wow <laughs> this is really, really tough. It's really beautiful, but the idea of this being your first bikepacking trip, um, obviously it was really hard for me to continue to find the motivation to keep going. In fact, I got to Colorado and I was like, I mean, people will think I did a great effort if I just, <laughs> if I just stop here. I mean, um, but no, no, no. My family said, so many people were rooting for you, so many young black girls, young women of color are looking at you and seeing you having this great adventure. So many people who look like you, um, and that's whether it was women or, um, I have to admit, I don't have a bicyclist or cyclist um, physique, um, I am just, the person who like lives next door, who's a school nurse, um, who decided to get on their bike and have this grand adventure. And they were all watching me. And so every time I got on the phone and I cried to my parents, they said, I'm glad you got that out. Now get on your bike and ride. <laughs> Um, one thing I really loved about this adventure is that I got to see a very unique part of uh, the United States. I travel from one small town to the next small town, and it was beautiful. So I got the beautiful scenery. I got to have this unique experience of going to these really small towns. Um, and that's me at the finish there. I did finally finish. <laughs> Now, all of that to say it was lots of fun and everything was beautiful, but it was not without hardship. Um, and that, for me, has been the most important part, was the parts that were really hard. Because doing hard things um, causes you to grow. Uh, one thing that I did not know is that when you go out there, um, that you're already bringing a lot of strength with you. Um, Stephanie, the co-leader of Black Girls Do, Do Bike, who did the Trans Am, she said, you know, life is harder than what I did. <laughs> and so bring life with you, being on what strength you have off of the trail, bring that to the trail. Um, and that's exactly what I did. Um, when you look at me, you see a black woman. Um, and in recent history, we've talked a lot about the trauma of black folks. And one thing that I really wanted to experience um, on this trip was to bring out the strength and resilience and joy of black folks because that exists too. And that is what I found on the trail. With that heart, <laughs> with that hardship, I experienced the worst sunburn I've ever experienced in my life. And you can imagine as a melanated person that the sun has to be really beating down on you. <laughs> And also, I got pretty sick. If you look at the first picture, um, I, 
who knows, I probably weigh about 180 pounds there. And if you look at the picture of me finishing, I have definitely lost 20 to 30 pounds. And that's over 45 days. Um, so I had trouble eating. I, it was my first bikepacking trip, so I didn't really know how you would eat on something like this. Uh, my filter broke, but I still needed to drink water. So I drank water and got pretty sick. <laughs> <laughs> But that, all, out of all of that hardship, um, it really was about finding the resilience of my ancestors, finding the resilience that women have to find every day as they exist in this world, and bringing that to the trail, and remembering that I can do hard things. As, well, then I came home. And I was like, oh my God, bikepacking is so amazing. If, even after all of that hardship, and I wanted to share the joy, but I knew that I had to get some things down pack. I mean, I was shipping home things every day left and right. I had no idea what I was doing out there. And I got myself down pack. I was like, how comfortable can I be with getting uncomfortable? Um, and so I was really able to pare down all the things that I took out there and do a little bit of lighter backpacking. And these are just pictures of me backpacking here in Colorado. And then Lel calls me up and says, Congratulations, great job. I would love for you to come to Iceland with me and do some more bikepacking. <laughs> and she said, but this time it's gonna be long days. We're gonna do 160 miles a day. We're gonna be in Iceland. We're gonna be going through the beautiful West Fjords. Um, and I want you to bring some friends. <laughs> and that's exactly what we did. And we did, and although she was like, lightning faster than me. Um, it was amazing to take on this challenge and go to Iceland and continue to realize that my body, this body, even though it looks different than what I see on magazines, this color, even though it looks different than what I see represented in cycling, that I can do these things. <laughs> And then I thought, this is so joyous. I need to go tell all the other black women about it. <laughs> and I need to get them on the trail too. And so that's exactly what I did. I went out, um, the group that I run, Black Girls Do Bike Denver, um, I decided that we should do a bike packing trip. And here's a picture of, our, of us planning our first one annual trip. Here, is a, here we are, um, leaving our front door, literally going Boulder. We went up, uh, what's the? Flagstaff. Flagstaff and beyond, Walker, Walker Ranch, <laughs> up to um, Ned, and we biked packed and we had um, a lot of tears. <laughs> um, and this is these women's first time bike packing. Then this year, look, there's a picture of you up there. <laughs> this year, we decided that we'd go out to Salida. So again, first time bikepacking. <laughs> and we take another group of women. And we are doing this every year. And these are people's first time bikepacking in Colorado, finding their own resilience, being able to leave this successfully and know that no matter what you look like, no matter what your body looks like, that you can do hard things, that there will be tears, there will be hard times, there will be mechanical failures, but you have everything inside of you to be able to get through that. And every single one of these women, these women of color, they were, able to successfully ride one of the hardest trails up in the Salida area. This is us coming up um, uh, pretty, or going down, coming down um, a pretty uh, horrific mountain we had to climb on our first day um, with the excitement of knowing that we were just about to finish. 
And that's us <laughs> celebrating <laughs> with the, a delicious fat tire beer. Um, and I just, I'm so glad that you, this is my last picture and, I, and I'm just so glad that you invited me here to share my unique experience and I appreciate y'all being here to listen to it. My organization is Rowdy Gowdy. Um, I fly all over the United States. I use my life savings plus the support of other people to get other women of color on bikes. Uh, if you're interested in supporting to help me out, uh, that would be great. You can follow me at rowdygowdy.com or you can go to my Instagram at rowdy underscore outside. Right on. Thank you so much, Brooke. You're amazing. Are we having fun or what? Good. Because it's, it's about to get funner. Is that a word? Ben, you're an English teacher. No, not a word. Okay, fine. Um, next up, we have my friend Jeffrey from Fort Collins. All the, do we have any Fort Collins people in the crowd? Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Jeffrey and I made a video last year. You may remember it. Um, we rode around Boulder, Colorado. We talked a lot about the initiatives that Adventure Cycling are, are doing, doing to get, get more people on bicycles. Adventure Cycling, if you don't know, have developed a lot of the big routes all across the United States, the Great Divide being one of them, the Trans Am route. And I will let Jeffrey talk about his personal story and how it led to Adventure Cycling. So let's hear it for Jeffrey Mazzell. <laughs> Thank you all very much for having me. Um, yeah, I want to start by just sort of connecting some of the dots. Um, Adventure Cycling, I'm here representing Adventure Cycling, the organization. And Ryan also said, hey, the other speakers are going to be here representing themselves. So like, don't just pitch the nonprofit nonstop, talk about yourself. One, I'd much rather not talk about myself. And two, I, I do want to connect some of the dots that Adventure Cycling started as an organization called Bike Centennial in 1976. Uh, when a group of people decided to bike across the country on a trail that didn't exist, which became the Trans Am, the Trans America route. Since then, it has grown into Adventure Cycling Association, which is the largest bike travel nonprofit in the world. And we maintain over 55,000 mapped miles of routes, including the Great Divide Mountain Bike Route, the Trans Am, the Northern Tier, the Southern Tier, and all over North America. Um, so that's just a little bit of background. I will do what Ryan asked and talk about myself just briefly and then maybe come back to adventure cycling at the end. As is my job. I can't get yelled at tomorrow at work, you know how it is. Um, so my, I would love to give you a really cool story of an amazing race that I won or an amazing piece of gear that I found. This is no shade on priority, but I don't have that amazing piece of gear that I found that changed my life. What I do have is a very short story about a broken down step through frame with a basket, most likely stolen bike in Japan. So I grew up in a small, on a small island in southern Japan called Okinawa. And I lived sort of in like this one square mile bubble in my life. Um, I, you know, I spent my days in the ocean spearfishing for cuttlefish, which is like a small squid. We would take them to sushi restaurants nearby that would pay us 1,000 yen per fish that we caught, which is about 10 bucks. And then one day, you know, so I'm in a, basically an idyllic, perfect little square mile of my world. That's all that revolved, my, my world revolved around. Everything was in walking distance. And there was a ditch between my house and the ocean that I walked on every single day of my life. One day, like something out of a traditional Japanese Hayao Miyazaki movie, there is a little black, rusted out, you know, step through bike with a basket on the front that was almost certainly stolen and left there. And you know, everything that I needed or thought I needed in the world was in, within one mile of me. So I don't know why I did this, but I walked inside, asked my dad, hey dad, can I go ride that bike? And he said, essentially, sure, just make sure you put it back at the end of every day in case its rightful owner comes back to get it. <laughs> so ride it, I did. I rode it for two days and it opened up my world past my one mile, my one square mile of life. I went down the coast. I went in and around the culture and I connected with more people in my community and I rode with my friends who had bikes and I'd opened up business opportunities for me to go to different sushi restaurants and try to get them to buy my cuttlefish, which none of them did. So anyway, they're lost, I know. 
Um, and then one day, as happens with life, nothing lasts forever, and the bike was gone. My dad says the rightful owner came back to get it, but we all know that's not true. It was stolen and somebody else took it. Um, but it is what it is, that's fine. But the, the thing that changed was my world rapidly went from one square mile to the size of my island, which is you know, 67 miles from north to south. So that's like a day ride for Brooke Rowdy Gowdy. For me at 15, it wasn't. Um, but you know, my world rapidly expanded. Um, my dad saw me moping around the house and decided, you know, I'm gonna take pity on this poor 15 year old. We went out and he got me a bike. The next day, he went out and got himself a much nicer bike. <laughs> and now we're riding together and this is where we really take off. Because now me and my dad are riding together, we're checking out the island, we're checking out our community and now things are really starting to click with us. Um, and it's still a really important sort of pastime for my family to ride around. My sister was actually just in Okinawa visiting for Thanksgiving, and they rode to one of our most favorite islands sort of on the outskirts of the island chain across beautiful bridges and over the, uh, over the beautiful ocean, stopped almost certainly for pineapple on the side of the road, as you do. Um, and I, I think that that is the important part about bikes for me. It's not necessarily that I got this super cool piece of gear. This all started from a bike that had a fender I didn't found the bike. I didn't know anything about bikes. I spent my days in the ocean. I had a fender that was kind of crooked, so every time I turned it a certain direction, maybe left, it pushed it farther out, and then it would start rubbing on the tire, and I'm riding, and I had to kick it back into place. So, but they have this ability to connect us to each other and to connect us to the world and the culture and the landscapes that we go through, and all of a sudden, my worldview has expanded. Fast forward a long, winding road through life, we can talk about it after, but we've lived everywhere in the US because I grew up in Japan and have no sort of home here. I certainly think of Fort Collins as home now, but how we got here and how I found Fort Collins as my home is via our bikes. So my children know um, Fort Collins by the view from the back of our family bike that has more than 10,000 miles on it. We did the math on it or something, but since the beginning of last summer, they have spent like 12 days on a bike and it's just in our town. They know our backyard sort of natural area from the saddle of their little mountain bikes. I realize that none of you asked, but they do shred and you'll most likely see them on YouTube <laughs> in the future. Um, you know, so that's sort of where my story kind of leads me to adventure cycling. I lucked out uh, with adventure cycling opening up to remote work uh, with the pandemic and now I lead the programs of the organization. So those programs being, the acronym is super cute, I know, it's RIDE. Um, so routes, innovation and discovery and experiences. So at Adventure Cycling, we create a robust network of bicycling routes like the Great Divide and the Trans Am. We partner with state departments of transportation to have high bike traffic thoroughfares designated as USBRS routes or US Bicycle Route System routes that you know, really uh, drive home safety and signage on the roads. And we have free short routes located in metropolitan areas across the country so that we realize that to ride the Trans Am, it takes a couple months, it takes skills, it takes money, it takes time off, it takes equipment. So we're trying to make bike uh, travel as accessible as possible for people who want to go from emerging rider, somebody who's interested in it, to we say adventure cyclist, but bicycle traveler. So I think I'll just, I'll just wrap this up sort of more There's, a, there's sort of a, a quote that I think that is, really, and I hate to end on a quote, I don't wanna, you know. It's okay. Our goal, <laughs> as a, as a, it's not a Ryan quote. Um, um, our goal as an organization with all of our programming is to bring the essence to emerging riders or people who want to be bike travelers of Edward Abbey, the famed novelist, when he said that, and I'm gonna cut out some words, a person traveling by bike can see more, hear more, and feel more in one mile than a motorized tourist can in a hundred. Oh, let me do what everybody else did. Shout out Adventure Cycling Association, adventurecycling.org. We provide direct financial assistance to groups that are taking bike travel experiences for people who want to get into bike travel. We have intro to bike travel workshops. We're developing our short routes, so check it out. Meet me after and we'll definitely talk about how you all can get involved and help grow the movement of bike travel. Right on.
Okay, so how many people here have ever met a professional baseball player? Oh. A few? A few? Oh, Dan, you, no, you don't get to play. <laughs> because our next speaker was a professional baseball player for the Boston Red Sox. You may have heard of them. They beat the Rockies in the World Series back in when? 2000 and... Okay, 2007. He has a World Series ring, but that's not why he's here tonight. He's not talking about baseball. I have a new friend. His name is Maddie Johnson. On YouTube, he is Maddie Active. I love what he is doing in the bike world. He decided during COVID to pick up bikes. He had never really biked in his life. And now he has a thriving YouTube channel where he teaches people how to bike. And I think what you're doing is absolutely incredible. So Matty Active, get on up here, buddy. Uh, <laughs> all right, I'm Matty, uh, Matty Johnson. Thank you, Priority, for having me. Thank you, Ryan, for inviting me out here. It's awesome to see all of you here. This is kind of nerve wracking. I've played baseball in like a thousand times more people, but I'm nervous to talk in front of you guys. So. But um, I'm happy to be here and um, thank you all guys for being here. I'm from a small town in Arkansas, Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Played baseball since I was like her age, like nine years old. So um, I grew up in Pine Bluff, never knew anything about biking or anything like that. All I knew was how to play baseball and I knew the only chance I got of getting out of that town is focusing on baseball. So uh, it was a crazy story. So I played baseball all the way up through high school. I was so focused on baseball that I didn't get to play my senior year of high school because of my grades. So I was ineligible my senior year of high school, couldn't play baseball. And um, luckily enough, I, got, I still got a scholarship to go to college. So I was able to go to college, play baseball, and um, wanted to play professional, but they kept telling me that I was too small and I wasn't strong enough, didn't have enough power. So that's when my persistence kicked in and I really believed in myself and I knew, I knew in my heart that I can do it, but I had to figure out some, some way to get them to believe that I can do it. So all through college, I never got drafted or anything. I went and played um, semi-professional one summer. It was after my senior year of college. I was like, let me try this out and see what happens. So luckily I made the team because somebody was injured and <laughs> <laughs> I made the team and caught a lucky break, no pun intended, but they, they stuck me in left field. I'm a center fielder. I was like, I never played left field in my life, but I guess I'm about to, to learn today. <laughs> so they stuck me in left field. I'm nervous to death, about as nervous as I am talking to you guys, but I was like, okay, this is my chance. I can kind of show what I can do at a level higher than college. And first play of the game in, in the first inning, the center fielder, was running for a ball, broke his hand. They stuck me in center field. And oh, I forgot to tell you, a couple months before this, I went to a major league tryout. They told me, basically, you suck. So I didn't even pass. It was three cuts. I didn't even make the first cut. And then I went to go try for that team. So back to that, guy broke his hand. They moved me to center field. Three, three or four months later, I ended up being the number one prospect in that league and uh, getting signed by the Boston Red Sox right after he told me that I pretty much suck. So that, <laughs> so my, my thing is that that's when I learned that persistence can take you a long way in life. And that's my, that's my goal in life is to just let people know if you, if you just don't take no for an answer, even if it doesn't lead you to the place you want to be, it'll lead you to somewhere great. And that's where the biking came in because after my career with baseball, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was like, this sucks because I've been playing baseball since I was nine years old and I didn't know what to do with myself after that. And I gained a bunch of weight. Like I can relate to Dan when he was talking about that. I had been an athlete my whole life and gained what, 30, 30 pounds. I'm too small to weigh 200 pounds. So I was, I think I got up to like 205 and I'm used to being around 170. And that's when I said, I got to make a change. So I had come to visit Colorado a lot, and I always knew I wanted to be here. So I said, you know what? I'm moving to Colorado, and I'll just figure it out from there. So I moved here, 
uh, I think it was a year, year and a half went by and COVID happened. So I was super bored and I didn't know what to do. I went to some random pawn shop and I was like, I'm gonna buy me a cheap bike and just ride around town and explore Denver. And I had a GoPro, but I never knew what to use the GoPro for. So I would wear it when I rode just to look at the city and the video when I got finished. And my GoPro got full. I was like, where do I put all this video? So I put it on YouTube and I was like, okay, now I got more footage on my, my uh, GoPro so I can keep using it. Went back and looked at the YouTube video a couple days later. It was, I think it had like 10 views or something. It's like, oh, that's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't think nothing of it. But I knew I had a, a hybrid bike. I think it was something like one of these gravel bikes. I didn't know anything about bikes at the time. So I just went into some uh, bike store and I said, I want a little bit better bike where I can go over bumps without it rattling my teeth. <laughs> so <laughs> they, they showed me this, uh, I think it was a, a Trek Marlin was my first ever like mountain bike. So I would ride that on the trails and I said, this is kind of fun. I'm gonna keep doing this. And then I would keep posting the videos on YouTube because I didn't know where else to put those long videos. <laughs> and more people kept watching. I'm like, I told my mom, I went to visit my mom in Texas during this time. I said, look, 30 people watched my video. <laughs> and <laughs> so uh, I was like, I'm gonna keep doing it, I guess. People like it and I like biking, so I kept doing it. Fast forward to now, sitting at 20,000 subscribers now, I think. <laughs> So I just got to, I mean, I can't be more thankful for bikes because bikes gave me a whole new purpose in life and took me out of a dark place in my life when I didn't think that I was meant for anything else other than playing baseball because I, I honestly didn't think I was good at anything except baseball. And then I started riding bikes and that's when it clicked that I'm not, I'm not an athlete. I feel like my purpose in life is to motivate and inspire other people and that's what I try to do through my YouTube channel and through bike. And so I try to get people on bikes and when they watch my videos, I want them to get that fuzzy feeling and just feel good about what they just watched and make them want to go out and ride bikes. Well now, Maddie, you can add public speaking to the list of things that you don't suck at. That was great, wasn't it? Thank you, thank you, absolutely. So. The final speaker for tonight is somebody very near and dear to my heart. And a lot of you know her. She is one of my best friends. She has been on the channel just a few times. Dana, it's uh, so amazing to have you sitting right here and looking at you. I'm going to introduce you, and you're going to get on this stage, and you're going to rock this world. But... Um, <clears throat> It's not often in life where your best friend is also your mentor and your guru. And I've learned so much from Dana about love and gratitude and not being judgmental. You know those bracelets that say, what would Jesus do? And you look at them just to make sure you're doing the right thing. I, many times in life, I will be going through a situation that might be difficult. And I think, what would Dana do in this situation? Because I always know that she would lead with love. She would lead with her heart in any situation, even if it's hard and uncomfortable. And so I have learned so much from this woman throughout the years. And she is an icon in Boulder. She started the wonderful Walnut Cafe and developed that into a very beautiful, beloved Boulder institution that was a safe place for all of the LGBTQ community. Dana is an all-star, and she's gonna share some stories with you tonight. Let's hear it for Dana D. There are a lot of you out there. <laughs> there really are. Um, well, first of all, thanks, Ryan. And that was such an awesome intro, so sweet. And uh, thanks to everybody from Priority here, um, Dave and Connor and Greg and all the folks. Gates, I met that guy. Oh, my god, I love those carbon drive belts. It's like butter. Carbon belt drive. Carbon belt drive. It's like butter. You know what I'm talking about. And uh, also to uh, BOA for giving us this awesome space. That's really great. So when Ryan asked me um, to speak, I was super excited and I was thinking about all the things I could talk about and 
because it's his crowd, I thought right away, like, wow, maybe I should be talking about being a lifetime endurance athlete. Or uh, maybe I could talk about uh, being a living donor. Like, that was really life-changing for me. I gave my brother a kidney, and um, since then, I've started a foundation in his name, the KRD Foundation. And there are three people on the board, Xantha, me, and Ryan. We do a fundraiser every year, and that's been really amazing to get a lot of kids on bikes when we do that. Um, I was thinking maybe I should talk about setbacks, because let me tell you, you don't get to be this old and not have some real stuff happen, both physically and mentally. And those are things that you have to get past. But really, I think Ryan invited me to take you to church. So <laughs> um, when I thought about what message or what story I have, the most important thing to me is how love and kindness and being a good person contributes to the amount of joy in my life, in this journey, and on every adventure that we go on. <laughs> I, um, I am a very disciplined person. I was uh, super coachable as a young athlete, and I got turned on to sports, and I was uh, pretty successful. Like, I, I figured out that with a little bit of talent and a lot of hard work that you could, you could be good at it. Um, I, I really enjoy being fit. I love taking care of myself and training, and I do that so that I can just be ready for whatever's next. Now, when it comes to when Ryan asked me to do something, I always ratchet up my training because, as we all know, he can make really hard things look easy. <laughs> but I find that I have a lot more fun if I'm, you know, physically fit and ready for whatever adventure he has coming. I have taken that discipline that I have and I've applied it to being a good person. You know, no matter what we are doing, if we're riding our bikes, we're running, we're climbing a mountain, or even at work, for those of you who are still working, <laughs> I recently retired, which is <laughs> really awesome. Um, the only thing that we can control is our attitude and how we are doing what we're doing. I've done it by what I knew how to do, and that was working out and training and coaching my spirit. You know how focused we can be when we set a goal, when we want to do something, we want to run a 5K, we want to run 100 miles, climb a mountain, win the Olympics, whatever it is, we set the goal, we have a plan, and we do the work. That's the same thing I do with my practice of love and kindness and being a good person. Do you know how much better we perform when we do what we're doing with joy, even if it's an uncomfortable experience, if we can smile from within, our focus changes to joy and gratitude. Even just putting ourselves in a place where we can experience a challenge is something to be grateful for. It's a privilege, really, to put ourselves in a position where we can go to the pain cave. You've been there. I know you have. <laughs> I met Ryan from going there. Even when we're uncomfortable, we can have that journey. And even in our everyday life, maybe it's on our daily commute on our bike, maybe it's on our two-hour training ride, when we allow ourselves to be present with our surroundings 
and to see the beauty and what is spectacular, that sunset, that sunrise, or even in the things that are mundane, the things that you pass all the time, but you see them in a different way. When we find ways to act with kindness and with attention whenever we can, we're on the bike path and we avoid that board that has the nail in it. We miss the board and we pull over and we stop and we move it off to the side so the next rider doesn't hit it. Even when you're in the grocery aisle and you're, you're passing people in, the path, in your pathway or on a bike path, but you, you really look at them and you see them like we acknowledge each other. If we make it a point in every activity we do, we choose our attitude. So when we are out there, smile, appreciate, be present with whatever we are doing. All those olays that Ryan sings in the tunnels, all of that puts him really present in what he's doing. And remember, our attitudes are contagious. We were just in New York where it was pouring rain on a ride that we had from start to finish. And everyone had such a great attitude that we were just in it. We knew we were gonna get wet, but it was an experience that we got to share together. And it was just so great to do you know, all of that. Like, and it was all about our attitude. That's what got us there. I choose to accept the journey that I am on every day. And I know that I am not the victim of anything in my life. Not the pouring rain, not the freezing snow, not the pulmonary embolisms, not the loss I may be grieving. Each day begins anew. Here's my quote just for you, Jeffrey. <laughs> As Maya Angelou said, and I love this, I use it every day. This is a wonderful day. I have never seen this one before. Every day is an opportunity for action. It's in every little thing we do taking your grocery cart back from the parking lot, picking up that piece of trash that someone else has just walked over or dropped, giving a seat to someone else that may need it. And then in every big thing that we do, like raising money, right, for a cause that we're passionate about, standing up for someone who's being bullied, not participating in mean speech or someone who's telling a joke or fake news. Even looking at that person that's holding the cardboard sign, but really seeing them and without judgment. And finally, be grateful. That is the fastest way to get to joy, is to find something to be, to be grateful for. I am and I have been many things in life, but what I am doing with my life is striving to lead with love. I have a daily mantra that I would like to leave you with now, and I hope that some piece of it might just stick with you. I say it every day. Sometimes I have to say it more than once a day, but it goes like this. I am grateful, I accept, I appreciate, I care about others, I look for ways to contribute, I care about life, I am in awe of life, and I'm so grateful to be a part of it. That's all I have. Thank you, Ryan.
Thank you so good. Thank you, Ryan. Do you know that Mr. Rogers quote, there's a lot of them since we're speaking about quotes tonight. When I would look on the news and I'd things, see things that scared me, my mother would tell me to look for the helpers. There's always helpers. And these five people who you just heard speak tonight are some of the helpers. Because what's going on in the world right now is scary and overwhelming. And we can scroll through our phones or watch the news and we wonder what's going to come of the future with climate change and wars and death and destruction. And it, for me personally, it really hits me hard because I want everybody on this planet to thrive, you know, and we can only do so much as individuals. But when you hear from people like this, Maddie, Dana, Brooke, Dan, Jeffrey, it gives me hope and it gives me hope to see all of you because we are the helpers. We are the ones who can make a difference in our own little communities. Maybe we start with our families and then we go to our neighborhoods and then maybe a little bit bigger level. But thank you so much to all five of you. Let's hear it for all of them real loud. The helpers. You are amazing and I love you. So I know we've been sitting for a while, so maybe we should like wiggle around a little bit. If you guys want to wiggle, do some wiggling. Like Danny's going to lead us in some wiggles. Yeah, good job. Here goes. Stand up, wiggle, wiggle. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Everybody kind of like stretch out. We got three more hours of this. <laughs> I'm not kidding, I promise. It's the season of gratitude and giving and thinking about others. And those are some of the things that really drive the content that I make. When I started my channel many years ago, the goal was to inspire people to get out there and get off their, their, their couches. And what I didn't know at the time from me going on adventures was that I would meet so many wonderful people along the way. And I call this, as you all know, when I meet somebody magical out there, trail magic, right? Yeah. And trail magic is really what makes me feel connected to the world. A lot of us have been on bike tours, right? And we've experienced the kindness of strangers who come out of nowhere to help us out and help us on our journey. Or maybe just help us out in that one little teeny moment that puts a smile on our faces. Sometimes it doesn't have to be huge. I've had some trail magic where people invite me into their homes and feed me meals and I get to camp in their backyards and all of a sudden we're best friends and I'm sending them Christmas cards. And you know, it just, it comes in many shapes in many forms. And it, it, during this season of like Thanksgiving to Christmas, I love Christmas so much. It's just so much fun. I love the music and I love the cartoons and the Grinch and all that good stuff. I really just feel like the world's a little bit more sparkly, right? It's a little bit more magic. We've got the Christmas lights on the houses. And I just feel, I, I feel better during this time of year, even though it's dark and I don't really like wearing, you know, long pants. I'm a shorts and t-shirt kind of guy. I'm a summer guy. I thrive in the warm weather. But this is the time of year where the world is just a little bit more magical. And it's because I think we think about each other a little bit more, right? We have a little bit more kindness in our hearts. And those are the things that I hope permeate throughout the rest of the year. And so when I meet people on the road and I experience some trail magic or I am here with you tonight, this is the kind of stuff that recharges me and makes me feel better about the state of the world. Because I've been really getting bummed out re recently with what's going on in so many different uh, areas. And I, you know, everybody always asks me, am I always so positive? Am I always so bouncy? And the answer is yes, no. <laughs> I'm a human just like you. I go through ups and downs. You've seen me on my channel struggling through heartbreaks or uh, talking about alcohol and just tough times. And uh, we, we go through these ups and downs that are just, they feel, you, sometimes you just feel like there's no hope and there's, there's nothing left to live for. And then you wake up and for me at least, what gets me out of those funks are my friends and my family and community and other people helping me out along the way. Danny's story is incredibly inspirational to me. I mean, I can't even imagine being at the depths that you've been to and finding a way to pull yourself out of that. And not only that yourself, but then share that message with the rest of the world through a bike ride 20,000 kilometers all over the United States. It's incredible, it really is. 
So I don't want to talk too much at you. You see me talking enough in my videos. I think it'd be fun to open this up to questions already and make it a little bit more interactive because you came a long way to get here. We have two friends that came all the way from Cortez, Colorado. How you doing? Which if you don't know is seven hours away. It's at the Four Corners near, near uh, New Mexico, Arizona, and Utah. I'm good at geography. Yeah, it's really hard to get here from Boulder. I mean, uh, yeah, I took the bus today to get here. <laughs> so I would love to open it up to questions and hear from you, and let's get this party started. I want to make this a little bit more interactive. So when you rode your uh, New Belgium skinny tire cruiser bike across the United States and one of the cranks broke off <laughs> towards the end of the ride, how did you finish that with one crank? <laughs> so this is an old adventure. The question was, I rode a New Belgium three-speed skinny tired cruiser across the country in 2009. And I did that mainly to show people that you don't need to have the best gear to do something big. And this was just like a $300 regular cruiser bike. And right before I was about to finish, I, about 75 miles away, my crank arm broke in half, completely just fell off of the bicycle. And from that point on, I was riding it one-legged. Luckily, I had SPDs on, so I was actually clipped in, so my one leg could do a lot of work. I could pull and push. And I rode that bike, I remember, I'll never forget it, 11 miles, one-legged, to a bike shop in a small town in West Virginia. And I was like, sweet, we'll be able to swap out the cranks and I'll be well on my way to triumphantly finish this ride in Washington, DC. And I get to the bike shop, it was a Tuesday, and on the door it says, we are not open on Tuesdays. How random was that? And I was like, oh man, what am I gonna do? So I sat on the curb, I probably called my mom and complained, and she's like, yeah, well, figure it out, buddy. You got yourself into this. And so I actually called the next bike shop down in Harper's Ferry. Everybody's heard about Harper's Ferry, right? And I talked to the guys and I told them what I was doing and they said, you know, we probably have this crank arm and you know, and I told them I couldn't get there, but you know, what I'll do is after work, I will put the crank in my car and I will drive up to you and I will fix your bike that night. And again, trail magic. This young guy came all the way up to me and fixed my bike right then and there, and I woke up the next day and rode it into Washington, D.C. So that's how I got through that pickle. Yeah. yeah. And it just goes to show that there's always a solution in life. There are many times in life where we think we're absolutely screwed and we don't think there's any way out, and we're just stuck, for lack of a better word. But there's always a solution. And like I said earlier, it usually involves other humans helping you. And when you reach out and when you put yourself out there, that's when the magic happens. I talked about this a bit on my adventure this summer in Sweden, where sometimes trail magic just happens. And you just come upon somebody who is just magically there at the right time and they take you in and they give you a shower when you're tired and cold. And then sometimes you really have to put yourself out there a bit and you have to ask for help. And there were a couple times in Sweden, if you watched that adventure, it was very rainy and very mosquito-y. It was miserable. <laughs> there were a couple times where I had to knock on some doors and say, hey, I am kind of S-O-L, and I would love some help here. And the Swedes were super cool, and they helped me in every instance. And if you watch these videos, you know what happened. People invited me into their homes, and they made us dinner, and it was, it was absolutely amazing. So um, there's always a way out, whether it's on a bike tour, or you're in a tough spot in a relationship, or you're at Voodoo Donuts and you don't know which donut to choose. You just ask for help. They will help you out. Okay, over here. Brooke. Okay, that's a, that's a fun question. I have never gotten that question. Really? Do I watch TV? I don't have actual TV, but I love streaming services and stuff. Um, I love Stranger Things. I think it's a really fun show. It brings back a lot of that 80s nostalgia. But on, I, you know, I watch a lot of YouTube, because YouTube just has so many wonderful things to watch and so many random ass, you know, that's not what I said. Random ass, <laughs> ra random ass, I was gonna say aspects, but I stopped halfway through and it sounded like ass. So now I've said ass in front of kids, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I like a lot of YouTube channels. There's a YouTube channel right now that I love called Climate Town. Have any of you seen this? It's an amazing channel. The, the host of the show, Raleigh Heath, is very, very funny, and he tackles a lot of subjects 
that are facing the world in the climate crisis. And it's a really good YouTube channel. You know what I love watching right now on YouTube are nostalgic Christmas commercials from the 1980s. And there are channels that put up commercials. If you ever are feeling nostalgic for an old Folgers com Christmas commercial, you can find them on YouTube. And there's like hours of people who have just like put together a montage of all these fun Christmas uh, commercials from the old days. And it makes me feel like a kid again, yeah. So I also like Rick and Morty when I'm feeling a little saucy. I loved Ren and Stimpy as a kid. How did I start biking? That's a great question. Thank you for that. Uh, Question. So I was in elementary school and I wanted a bicycle. Probably like a lot of you can relate to this story. Bikes are so much fun. Every kid wants a bike. And I remember asking Santa Claus, this is before you asked your parents for things because Santa was the one who got you stuff. And I remember asking Santa Claus for a bicycle. And I will never forget, speaking of nostalgic 80s Christmas commercials, waking up on Christmas morning and seeing a gray, BMX bicycle under the Christmas tree. There were actually two, because my sister and I both got them at the same time. And that bike, and I've talked about this before, became my freedom machine. That bike allowed me to see parts of the world that I'd never seen before. Because when you're a little kid, it's hard to travel on your own. You always have to be with your parents in a car, or they're holding your hand, and they're guiding you. But once you get that bicycle, you can go past the confines of your neighborhood. And those were some of the first feelings of freedom that I ever had on my own. And I remember riding to my elementary school on Saturdays and Sundays and playing on the playgrounds. And it led to this crazy life of riding my bicycle all over the world. And I still call my bike the freedom machine because we can all relate, it is, right? If you're having a bad day, you get on your bike and immediately within moments, you feel better. You feel the fresh air in your face and you're ringing your bell and you're just like, ah. Oh, Life is good and you hear some birds tweeting above you and maybe you see some cool clouds. I've really been into clouds lately. There's been so many cool clouds in the sky of Colorado lately. Have you guys all seen these beautiful pink, like fluffy cotton candy clouds at sunrise and sunset? So just the little things in life you notice more when you're on a bicycle. When you're in a car, obviously you can't see as much. A lot of times there's music playing or you're talking to somebody in the car. But when you're on your bike, like what Dana was saying, you're very present with what's going on in the world. And I feel way more connected to my community, my neighbors. I can stop and be like, oh, hey, it's Johnny. Stop and just talk with him. I feel more connected to nature, and I feel more connected to myself. You know, a lot of my bike trips, I'm not riding around my neighborhood. I'm going on extremely difficult adventures. And when I push my body to the absolute limits, I feel alive. And I've been saying this ever since I rode my bike home from Honduras, that that adventure made me feel more alive than I'd ever felt in my life. Because I was on my bike out there in the middle of nowhere and you feel everything, the rain, the sun, the wind. In some moments, it's not fun. It's very hard and your muscles are screaming at you and maybe your backside is screaming at you. I'm watching my language because we have kids here. And you just, you don't want to be there anymore. Like, why am I doing this to myself? Why am I riding day after day, hundreds and hundreds of miles? Why, why, why? But then you take a step back and you're like, you know what? This is pretty magical. I chose to be here. I get to do this. It's a privilege to be able to be on my bike traveling around the world. And not only that, but nowadays, I'm not just traveling for me, I'm traveling for you. I get to show you the world. I get to introduce you to the people who I meet along the way who are making my journey magical and are hopefully making you feel better about the world and that humans aren't all bad. I get a lot of emails from people around the world outside of the United States who say, wow, I watch the news about your country and it scares me. There's so many bonkers things going on in the United States and it makes me never want to travel there. But then I watch your channel and I watch your videos and I see the people that you're meeting out in the middle of nowhere and I feel better about humanity and I feel better about Americans. So I feel like when I'm on my bike, I'm an ambassador for my country. I'm trying to show people the best of who America is all about, right? And so there's so many deep things where it's not just about the bike. Sorry, Lance, I just stole his book title. <laughs> Remember that book by that guy, Lance Armstrong? It's not all about the bike. It's about the people and the connections. Sure, I like pushing my body. I like pushing the limits. But really, it's about the people who I meet. And in this room tonight, 
standing out there before the event started, being able to shake your hands and hug you means the world to me. Because again, I started this channel a long time ago. Everybody who's started any type of channel, Maddie, Danny, you start from zero and you get excited when 10 people watch your videos and then 20 people watch your videos. And to be able to fill a room tonight with you wonderful, beautiful souls from all over Colorado and Texas. Yeah, here we go. She came in from Dallas, Texas. <laughs> Amazing. It makes me feel better about the world. And I hope that you go home tonight and you feel better about the world and you feel more connected and you feel more inspired about humanity and what we can all do to make this world a better place. Because when it comes down to it, my channel is cool. I love it. It's super fun. It's my job. I love sharing stories with you. But I really hope that it makes you want to make this world a better place. Getting on your bikes or running or just going over to your neighbor's house and being like, hey, I baked some cookies for you. So this is an assignment for all of you. I want you all to bake some cookies for your neighbors and give them to your neighbors this weekend. Do it, seriously. You'll like make a new friend, it'll be amazing. And if you do it, please let me know. Book, bake some cookies for your neighbors this weekend, Maddie. I know you're good at making chocolate chip cookies. All right, that was a long answer to your question. <laughs> Do we need to wiggle a little more? Okay, do we have any more questions? I can see a hand, okay, right there. So the question is essentially, when you're out on your bikepacking trip and you're in the middle of nowhere for a long time and you come back to a situation like this, is this overwhelming to be around so many people? There are times where, where it's overwhelming, but I love this. This is what I live for. These are the moments. I like making videos, but when I'm out there in the middle of nowhere talking to my camera by myself, it feels a little weird. But right now I'm talking to you, which is totally normal. It's not weird at all. Um, so, you know, I want to give each and every one of you a moment. You know, I want to like hug you and, and, and shake your hand or whatever and talk to you and hear your stories because all of you have amazingly inspirational stories. I talked with a gentleman earlier today who lost over 100 pounds in the last six months. And I, yeah, amazing. And I get emails like this all the time and I want to give people a piece of me because I don't want to just, you know, kind of, oh, yeah, nice to meet you, see you later, bye. I want to, like, give you that time and that, that energy. But it does take a lot of energy sometimes. And I go home after these things, and my throat is super sore, and I'm tired, and I'm exhausted, but my heart is really full. So uh, I guess the answer is, no, it doesn't overwhelm me, you know? It's pretty special. It really is. And it energizes me. There was a question right behind you. Yep, there we go. Why do I keep going back to Burning Man? <laughs> Have you seen my Burning Man videos? Do you know what he's talking about? Okay. <laughs> Bobalicious and Missalicious are in the crowd tonight. They are the ones that motivated me many years ago to go to Burning Man. And I'd always heard of this event out in the desert. And, you know, for many years, I kind of pushed it off. You know, I don't want to do this. It sounds like a bunch of dirty hippies. You know, not my thing. I might be from Boulder, but I'm not a dirty hippie. Look at my, look what I'm wearing. <laughs> but I finally said yes. I answered the call to adventure. And I went with Bob Alicious and I camped with him. And it was one of the most beautiful weeks of my life. And the reason why I go back to Burning Man every year is because I see the best of humanity. I see 80,000 people coming together to create something very special and to share their passions with the world. There is so much beautiful art out there. There are so many beautiful people out there just sharing love and kindness. Dana has been with me to Burning Man. I brought my mom to Burning Man. Xantha loves Burning Man. Xantha is Dana's wife and she can't get enough of Burning Man. She went with us and it was a, a little rough. Burning Man's not easy. It's very hot, it's very windy, there are dust storms, but I keep going back because it's magical. And I come back after those seven days and I feel recharged about humanity. And it motivates me to bring some of that magic to my everyday life and to my videos. So that is why I keep going back. I also love running the ultra marathon. It was the first ultra marathon that I ever ran. And it really opened my eyes to the world of an event that wasn't super competitive. I grew up in the world of running where like every race was very nerve wracking because I wanted to win. And if I didn't win, I was super bummed out and I'd have a bad attitude. And I kind of gave up running for a little bit. And once I went to Burning Man and ran the Ultra, I was like, we're just all out here having fun. It doesn't matter what place you get. We're all out here to support one another and get, get through something very, very difficult. Because it's not always easy to run 31 miles in the blazing heat. So that's the answer to your Burning Man question. Not because there's like lots of naked people and stuff. <laughs> which is cool too, I guess. 
how do I choose my adventures? So I have a long list in my mind of adventures that I want to accomplish in my life sometimes, but you'd probably be pretty surprised to know that I don't really have things all that well organized. I really have no idea what I'm going to do next year, but it kind of comes as it comes, and that's how I just go through life. I just figure it out. And somebody, sometimes viewers, will say, hey, you should try this. And I'm like, wow, that seems really cool, and I'll go do it. And then other times, I'll be looking at other people on YouTube doing great bikepacking adventures, and I get ideas from them. But really, when it comes down to it, when I choose an adventure, I want something that's beautiful, full of nature. I don't ride on pavement nearly as much as I used to. I like riding on dirt because dirt is a lot safer. When you're on pavement, you're dealing with cars. Cars are scary. The humans driving the cars are scary sometimes. Danny got hit on his ride um, across the country. And I really try to stay away from roads because there's so much distracted driving. So I want to pick something that's beautiful and fun. And I know that I'm going to connect with humans wherever I go. But I want to try to find a route that I know will have just really cool villages to visit along the way. You know, I love Mexico. I lived in Honduras for two years. I speak Spanish, so I feel very comfortable in Latin America. Here we go. Oh, Maddie, you're second. Here we go. Uh, favorite cycling city in the world? Fake, favorite uh, cycling city in the world? Um, let's see. I mean, it's all over Europe. Europe, they've been doing cycling right for a long, long time. When I lived in Sweden as an exchange student back in 1997, I really got a firsthand look of how cycling culture makes communities stronger because they're built for cycling and it's safe and everybody rides their bikes. I remember my Swedish mom, cute little Annika, every morning would get on her bike with a little basket in the front and ride to the nearby bakery and get fresh bread and bring it back to the house every morning. And I was like, wow, that's so cool because in the United States, we almost would never, con I mean, you all would, but most people would never consider getting on their bikes to do an errand. They get in their car, it's just automatic, right? But Sweden was different. People would ride their bikes to school. I also remember Swedish girls getting all done up to go to parties and miniskirts and makeup and riding their bikes to parties in high school. And I was like, this would never happen in the United States, not, at least not at that time in Boulder. And I was like, you know what? This, I was, I'd always, always been a bike rider at that point. I still had never had a car, no driver's license. I still don't have a car. Um, and it just was like, okay, this is, this is way cool. So Sweden for me is one of the best cycling countries in the world, I would say. There's so many safe bike lanes all over the place. But Copenhagen, Denmark, I would say, is the number one city I have been to for cycling infrastructure. Amsterdam is amazing. What Paris is doing right now is absolutely incredible. They have transformed the downtown in a very short amount of time. People have embraced it, and I love that. And I really hope that more cities in the United States get on board with this. We're finally starting to get there with some of our transportation initiatives and realizing the, port the importance of people riding their bikes, not just to reduce traffic congestions, but to make the roads safer and to make us humans healthier because as you've seen me say a million times in my videos what happens when you get on your bike you feel better you feel good imagine if all of our all of us rode our bikes more often there's no road rage on a bicycle that only happens in cars when you're on your bike it reduces your blood pressure and you just feel good and so i really hope that we get more and more people out there on bikes and that's the goal of a lot of the people who spoke here tonight my favorite trip Whoa, that's a hard question because so many of them have uh, meaning in different ways. But I would say, I mean, the, the ride home from Honduras to Boulder was pretty monumental. At that time in my life, I didn't know what it would lead to. I just wanted to go on a big adventure. I had just served in the Peace Corps for two years in Honduras, and it was a big transition time in my life. I was going from being a Peace Corps volunteer to being an adult and getting a real job, and I didn't quite know what that meant. All I knew was that I wanted to ride my bike home because it would give me a lot of time to think. Because when you sit on your bike, you have so many hours to think and figure out life, and I needed to figure out life. I wanted to know what the next step would be. So I got on that bike, and I just thought about things all day, every day for three months, and it led to this life that you've seen now on my YouTube channel. And uh, I'm extremely grateful for it. Like I said, I didn't know what it was going to lead to, but it really showed me that I love telling stories. 
I had a little Sony Handycam and I filmed the adventure. A lot of you have seen this on YouTube. I didn't know what I was gonna do with this video at that point. There was no YouTube, there was no online video. I just thought, okay, I'll make like a cool home video of my adventures and share it with some friends. And that video led to essentially me wanting to be a video storyteller. And for many years, I tried to be like a TV host on Travel Channel and other networks. And I had some success and I bounced around the entertainment world for a while, but it was frustrating because I didn't have control over anything. I would always be sitting by the phone waiting for it to ring to get that next job or for a pilot to get a green light. And it was just nerve wracking and heartbreaking because I'd get my hopes up and I'd be so excited about the big thing and then it would tank and then it was like, okay, starting over from zero. And then Finally, but the last straw was in 2016, I had shot a pilot with Travel Channel for a show that I was sure was gonna become a national show. They all told me it was one of the best pilots they'd ever shot. And then Travel Channel got bought out by a different parent company and they killed everything that was in production. And I was like, oh man, I can't keep doing this. So that's what I was like, okay, I'm gonna try YouTube. I'm gonna try building up a channel big enough to the point where I can make a living doing what I love. And I started from zero, just like Maddie, getting no views on my videos. It just was mom and, and brothers and family. And it took a long, long time to build up my channel to the point where it is now. And believe me, there were many times where I second guessed what I was doing. At this time in life, I was 35 years old. Most of my friends had real jobs, were making real money, were buying houses. And here I am living in mom's basement like a loser. No, I wasn't a loser. I loved living with mom. Thanks, mom. <laughs> I lived in my mom's basement not knowing where this was all going to lead. And it was scary at times. And I thought, well, maybe I should just give up this dream and get a regular job in the journalism world. But I stuck with it. I persevered. I was very stubborn. I was very motivated. And I thought that this message was something that would resonate with people and that someday the money would come. I've never been motivated by money. And luckily, when living in your mom's basement, you don't need to make a lot of money because you know, mom does your laundry and makes you dinner. Just kidding. I would make my mom dinner sometimes. And it slowly led to what I'm doing today, when I'm incredibly grateful for it. But I didn't know if it was gonna work. I still don't know if it was, it's gonna work. You know, there are some days where I'm like, oh man, I have no idea what I'm doing. You've seen me talk about burnout, a video I made about a year and a half ago where I was like, I don't know if I can keep doing this. The YouTube grind is getting to me. I feel like I've told the same story over and over and over and I feel like I'm wearing out my audience because they're getting sick of me. Ole, ole, no crashies, whammies, nah, you know? You start to doubt yourself. You really do. And it's scary. You're like, wow, now I'm like in my 40s and I don't have a real job and I'm not making real money and overwhelming. But again, I've always just tapped into that inner spirit of sharing inspirational stories with the world, hoping that it would someday work out. And it's working out, yay! <laughs> and it's working out because of you, it really is. And so that's why these moments mean so much to me. They really do. I'm, gonna be, I'm not gonna be able to sleep tonight. This feels like Christmas Eve to me. I'm gonna be so jazzed up and full of energy from meeting all of you and being here tonight. It really is absolutely incredible, yeah. <sighs> Are we, do you guys want to leave? Are you guys like sick of sitting? Are you okay? All right, we have one more question. Here we go. Great question. Um, essentially, the question is, do I ever foresee myself stopping being a YouTube creator? And I ask myself this a lot. You know, I'm 44 years old now. I've been doing this for a long time, but I absolutely love it. Like, I really, really love it. I feel like I'm at the prime of my life. The, the adventures still light up my soul, and that's really what it's all about. I still love traveling. I still love connecting with humans, and it makes me feel alive, just like that very first bike ride home from Honduras. Meeting people is exciting. Meeting you is exciting. Meeting somebody in the middle of nowhere, Mexico, and being invited into their small house and eating a meal with them is really exciting. And I don't think that's ever gonna get old. This might morph into something different someday, who knows? Maybe more books, maybe a podcast where I don't have to constantly be on the road filming adventures and beating up my body. Adventures are getting harder and they're, they're starting to wear on me where day after day after day you're riding 70 to 100 miles and you wake up in your tent and you're just like, oh my gosh. And not only am I out there on the adventures doing them, 
but it's hard to film them. Like I'm constantly thinking of the shots that I need to get to make a dynamic video for my YouTube audience. So it's a lot to think about, but right now, I really, really, really love it. So I, I don't know how it's gonna end up, where I'm gonna go with all this. Maybe I'll move back into mom's basement. Right, mom? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> but right now, I, I love it, I really do. I'm, I'm feeling very energized. Thank you for that question, that was cool. Yeah, over here, good question. Do I ever go on adventures that I don't film? And I don't. If I'm gonna take the time to go on an adventure and do something big, I'm gonna film it because it's, it, you know, and I've, I'm, I've tried to do this where I go on an adventure just for me, but uh, I'm out there and I'm like, oh, there's so many beautiful things happening. I have to be capturing this. I need to get all these shots. I wanna, you know, I'm a built-in storyteller. It's impossible for me to just stop. And so I wanna share the stories. And I think sometimes when I go on adventures where maybe I'm not 100% psyched, that makes, the story that I'm telling a little bit more authentic because I think you can relate to it more because we're not always at 100%. We're not always bouncing off the walls and life is amazing, oh my God, best day ever, woo! You know, there's some days that are, that are just tough and you have to struggle your way through them. And those are the days that I remember the most. And those are the days that really teach me the most about myself. Brooke was talking about the value of doing hard things. And I've done so many hard things over and over and over in my, in my life whether it's on a bike or running, that I feel like I'm getting practice for when life throws things at me that I'm not choosing. Because my adventures I choose, but there are some times in life that are just hard that you didn't choose. You know, relationships end, or other tough things are going on, and all of these tough things that I put myself through have given me a bit of mental fortitude to give to, and strength to let me know that I can work through this. And again, it goes back to, I can do a lot of it, but I need to really lean on my friends and my family to help me through the hard times. I can't tell you how many times I have cried with Dana over all sorts of things in my life, mostly breakups, right? Yeah, yeah, and Dana's always been right there for me through the hard times, and I'm sure we all have a Dana in our lives, or at least I hope we do, and if you don't have a Dana in your life, Dana will be the Dana in your life. <laughs> yeah, right on. How are we feeling? Good. Greg, should we do a giveaway or something? Of course. Okay, of course, right on, okay. What, what are we gonna give away right now? Okay, who wants that bike? Wow, it's so pretty. So this is the Priority 600X, the bike that I designed in conjunction with my friends at Priority. It's the bike that I ride all over the world. It's got the Gates carbon drive and the pinion drivetrain, super low maintenance, so it doesn't really break. So Maddie, this would be a great bike for you. Oh, you already have one, don't you? Lucky. All right, all right here we go. We probably need some sort of a drum roll. Okay, what is it? Oh, you want me to go? Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. Look. Okay, I'm not looking, I'm not looking, I'm not looking. Okay, la 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 la. Chad Pritchard. Yay! All right, buddy, way to go. Dana's gonna be giving away hugs all night. Come give hugs from Dana. We're gonna hang around for a little bit because the speakers would love to hear from you. I'm sure you have some questions for them. We want to interact with you as long as we can. We know it's late, we know it's cold, but we just want to say thank you so incredibly much for coming out here tonight. Supporting me, supporting Priority Bikes, supporting Dana and Maddie and Dan and Jeffrey and Brooke. This is the good stuff in life, seriously it is. So thank you all so much for being here. Drive home safely or ride your bikes home safely and we will see you next time. Cheers. Yeah.